All right, so um, we're going to, for a while, God willing, <clears throat> look at um, encounters Jesus had with all sorts of different people um, as recorded in John's Gospel. I am hoping and trusting and praying that in these days and months ahead that God gives many of us encounters with different people and an opportunity in different ways to share the name of Jesus, that wonderful name, because there are plenty of situations which you face and which I face, and if we don't name the name of Jesus, there isn't a substitute, there isn't another person who can do what you can do. And one way to look at John in a different light is to see that throughout the days that God gave John, uh, sorry, throughout the days that God gave Jesus, that's exactly how Jesus behaved. One way to read John is to look at Jesus as the what's the word, the perfection of, um, of a personal evangelist. We think of Jesus and the multitudes and feeding the, 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 the thousands who followed him, and that's true. Well, it's true early in his public ministry, but John's gospel records um, many, no doubt not all by any means, but many personal opportunities that Jesus grasped and used to turn people's lives towards the Lord. And that's part of what John's Gospel records for us. So we looked at um, Nathaniel, this young man from Cana last week, and how he overcame his, his prejudices and his pride and saw that the man standing before him was the very Son of God. Well now we come to John chapter 2 and uh, this wasn't a, a, an event, the wedding in Cana that was uh, in any way um, a deliberate evangelistic campaign or anything like that. It was a wedding, a wedding in Cana, the same town that Nathaniel came from. And uh, Jesus was invited to the wedding. Let's, uh, it's the longest passage. We won't probably read anything else this morning, but I wonder if we can read this out together. When Jesus and his disciples were invited to a, a wedding in Cana. Let's read it out, shall we? On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to them, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, 
And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine until now. The beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to us. I think it's quite interesting that this was the third day of Jesus' ministry after um, his anointing for ministry after his baptism in the River Jordan. I don't think it's probably an accident that it was the third day of his public ministry that Jesus was at a wedding. <clears throat> and this, John tells us, was the beginning of his mirac miracles. Well, it's, uh, it's perhaps good to think that this was the first of many miracles, and we could probably rush ahead to the significance of the first miracle that Jesus performed being at a wedding. Arguably, his last and greatest miracle of all is to call a people who were not a people to a wedding feast. And this is not a wedding feast that is uh, just for a few days, but a wedding feast which is prepared for his people, uh, well, his bride, his heavenly bride, a feast that uh, will not come to an end. Not that these um, <clears throat> weddings at this time were, uh, were small events. Weddings were, uh, well, it's obvious they lasted for days at a time and were big events in the communities. They were part of what held the community together in, in the times when Jesus appeared on the earth. Weddings were a big deal. Whole villages came out and, and celebrated together. But this wedding <clears throat> went down in history more than many another because Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. Um, no doubt <clears throat> there were family connections. Jesus' mother was there. This was not um, Mary as we think of her as a young girl visited by the angel. Mary now is, um, well, the way I read this story, she's a, a woman probably of some substance in the community, organizing the wedding with another village in Cana. She knows exactly what's going on. She's aware of everything that's happening. Perhaps she was involved in the planning of the wedding. Who knows? Seems like it because she was aware that they were going to be seriously embarrassed because they were running out of wine. They were several days into the wedding and they hadn't bought enough in advance. That would have been a terrible embarrassment and shame to, to the couple. Isn't it interesting? This dear woman knew exactly what many had not realized, that her son, this Jesus of Nazareth, well, what did she know? We're told that as a young woman, every prophecy that was spoken of the infant Jesus, uh, she kept these things and she pondered them in her heart. She had seen him grow. Um, she knew who he was. So perhaps it's no surprise that to save embarrassment and to save um, shame and gossip, she went to Jesus. He said, they, they've, got no, they've got no wine. Well, that's a good start, isn't it? 
inviting Jesus into your, the events of your life. That's what happened. We don't know who this couple were, but they had invited Jesus to be present in a, in the, in a major event in their life. And when there was trouble and difficulty and the risk of embarrassment and shame, Mary turned to Jesus. Well, I think his response is surprising. Um, it's translated in this and quite a few Bibles. Woman, what have I got to do with you? Well, I've read a, a slightly more sympathetic translation than that, which um, said, woman is a bit too disparaging. It, it may be better translated something like lady. So it's, a, it's not a mark of disrespect, but lady, what has that to do with me? Now, you can't take away from the fact that there's a distancing going on there. Jesus is standing back from the family life he has had, from his mother who has nurtured when he was a young baby, together with uh, his supposed father, Joseph, protected and kept him. And Jesus stands back from it. <clears throat> in a way it had happened years previously do you remember the story of when Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple and uh, they were they were much more community minded in those days and they had all gone down perhaps a contingent from um, their hometown in Nazareth to the temple and they were on their way back and Mary and Joseph probably presumed that Jesus was with another family traveling. And then they found he wasn't and they searched all over and Mary told Jesus off. She said, where, where have you been, your father and I? And I'm not exaggerating in saying this. Your father and I have been worried sick. We, we've been really worrying. Where have you been? And Jesus stood back even when he was younger. And he said, didn't you know, you can finish the quote, can't you? I must be about my father's business. Well, this event with Mary is, is perhaps an even harsher distancing from those family ties which had to be loosened for him to fulfill God's calling on his life. What have I got to do with you? <clears throat> it, there's a lesson for all of us. This gospel is quite clear that if we love our father or our mother or our brother or our sister or our son or our daughter, more than we love God, we're making a mistake. This gospel does ask us and even command us to put our relationship with the Lord first. And it, no doubt it was a bit painful for Mary. I mean, when she had taken the infant to the temple so many years before, about 30 years before, a man called Simeon had prophesied. And for all the joy she had of bearing this child who was the son of God, and she knew it, but there'd been a prophecy, a sword will go through your heart. And you will know sorrows amidst the joy of living closely with the Son of God, and seeing him increase in wisdom and in stature, but you will know sorrows. 
And there are lessons for all of us in, in knowing Jesus. There's a joy in his presence, in knowing him, loving him, deepening our relationship with him, but it doesn't come without sorrows and it doesn't come without some pain. And Mary, that most blessed of women, did know sorrows as well. And in fact, and I'm sure many of you will know this, Jesus was saying something that only probably he at that time understood the significance of. He said, woman or lady, I've got to stand back from you. My hour has not yet come. Well, what hour was that? John tells us later on, we needn't um, necessarily read it out, but the whole of the gospel story is pointing to an hour which would come when the Son of God would sacrifice his own life in order to make a way for those, anyone, anywhere who wanted to find the truth as it is in God and in Jesus could have their sin forgiven and come into a living relationship with him. So if we look at, uh, if you've got a Bible, turn to it, at John chapter 19 and verse 26. This is, a, this is the hour when, when history changed, when the Son of God voluntarily gave up his life that you and I might spiritually pass from death to life. And Mary was there. Most of the disciples forsook him and they fled away, but Mary was there. Imagine that, imagine that, watching your own son, but the son of God. And she was there. She wasn't alone. There were a number of women watching what was going on. John chapter 19, verse 26. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to the woman, sorry, he said to his mother, lady, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, now that's John who wrote this gospel, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Jesus was referring to that hour at the very beginning of his ministry. Look, I'm, what have I to do with you? At this point in time, I need I need to fulfill this ministry that God has given me to announce good news to the poor. I can't make you my first priority. Following God has to be my first priority now. But there will come an hour when I will make provision for your need. She would lose her son. And Jesus said to John, I'm giving you the charge. And, and John took her into his own home. Amen. It's a wonderful story. He, when Jesus does not appear to care for you, it may be that the hour is not yet right. But it will come. It will come. When the hour comes, he will provide what you need. But he may take you to the cross first. Amen. This, this gospel that we follow, this learning of his ways, it's not always peace and light and joy. There's a rigor in coming to the point where you and I say, all right, 
all right, I, I'm, I'm coming to you, Jesus. No matter how painful, no matter how difficult, no matter if I have to say, family, that's not my first priority, or whatever it is, I need to put God first. That's what Jesus was doing. Mary was not any more than you or I a special case. We are all individual cases. There's nobody quite like you. But you're not a special case. You've got to come to the cross just like Mary did. Amen. Amen. But there's more in this story, this, this wise lady. Whatever he says to you, whatever he says to you, do it. Do it. Learn the way of obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it, isn't it? She told the servants, the master, the, the important man, the man in charge of everything, he missed the point, but not the servants. Whatever he says, learn obedience to him. Do what he tells you to do. It will save you from embarrassment, save you from shame, both in this life and the next. If you and I just learn his ways and become his servants, something amazing will happen in the most ordinary of lives, and that's you and me. What will happen? Well, water will turn into wine. Hallelujah. Of course, there were steps to go through. I enjoyed that little video but it wasn't quite right about the water the, about those uh, water pots they weren't the, the little video said they were they were wine jars they weren't they were water pots and they were great big things they would have been about this high and uh, pretty much about the size in volume that they contained of a person I mean, 20 or 30 gallons is, is, is quite a large container, isn't it? And Jesus said, just fill them, just fill them, just fill them. They, 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 were, they would have been there not to hold wine initially, but because in Jewish things they had to keep washing all the time. That was all sorts of ceremonial stuff. Jesus would do away with all of that. Just fill it up and then pour it out, draw it out and pour it. And as they poured it, as they poured it, wow, they saw the water turning into wine. Well, the master of ceremony didn't understand what was going on, but he did understand, wow, this is, uh, I, I'm not much into wine. Does anybody the name of a, know the name of a really good wine? I don't know. That's probably just as well we don't. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's volunteering the name of a really good wine. <laughs> okay. I think Jacob's Creek might have been what they would have had at the beginning. It doesn't matter, does it? The point is it was a fine wine. It was a, a choice vintage. It, it, it had all sorts of, I don't, want to, I don't want to awake your thirst for wine, <laughs> but it, it, would have had, it would have had subtlety and strength all in the taste. Amen. What can God do with an ordinary life? which is prepared to say, okay, I've been full of all sorts of things, perhaps things I shouldn't have been full of, but Lord, you fill me. What can God do with a life which says, 
not only fill me, Lord, but let me be poured out for you. Let, let me, let me, let, let words be poured forth from my mouth which honour you. Wouldn't it be good if one or two of us are able to do that in the streets of Usley in the month of head, uh, ahead? Let some words come out of my mouth which are poured out in honour of you. God can take things which are bland, which are ordinary, which are not special or, or not vintage. He can change what is insipid, he can make perfected. He can, he can change the tone of your and my life. Amen. I, I was reading a testimony this week of um, a hymn writer. And um, <clears throat> you know these wonderful old hymns, Heaven above is softer blue, earth around is, it, is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue, Christless eyes have never seen. The man who wrote that hymn said, after he turned to the Lord, he, he literally looked around and the earth had a wonder to it it had never had before. Wow. That's water turned into wine. That, that's a life having, having a, a savour to it, having a glory to it, having a presence to it without which it's just nothing. And that is you and me. You're a water pot, you know that? Amen. Jesus just wants to fill us and to teach us to learn to pour ourselves out for him. Amen. This was the first miracle that Jesus did and it was no accident. He was going to prepare a bride for himself. He would, he would become the master of the feast in reality. Amen. And, and, and he's, he's calling us to, uh, to not put other things first, ever, but to do whatever he says to do. Amen. Let's pray for a moment um, and then we'll, we'll sing a hymn together. Lord, thank you that you mixed with ordinary people. You, uh, you passed through the days of your life not unlike any one of us and they were filled with the glory of God. Thank you for what you did in those days for those people. And it's the mark of what you're doing now, Lord, in the hearts of anyone who turns to you and who, who says, uh, I'll do whatever you say. I'll invite you into the circumstances of my life. Amen. Do a, do a miracle, Lord, in, in the lives of your people. Uh, enrich our lives with your presence. Though there may be sorrows, Lord, though there may be things we need to turn from, you're our God and you, you are calling us to a greater feast than just in this life. You, you are calling us to sit down and to feast with you uh, in the table you are preparing, even in the presence of our enemies. And we bless your name together. And God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen.